In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. I've always enjoyed my private conversations with the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, and I knew the importance he attached to Darwin's theory of evolution in the development of disbelief. So I asked him why he'd called his book Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And one of the points he made was simply that the theory of evolution was easy to understand, and that's what made it so dangerously subversive. Unlike some other great scientific advances, going back to Newton or certainly Einstein or, or best case perhaps quantum theory, unlike these bizarre revolutions, uh, I think that Darwin's theory is really quite easy to understand. It, it, you don't need any math. The basic idea is so simple that you have variation, that inevitably if there's variation in the population, some are going to be better than others, and the ones that are better than others are going to have more kids than the ones, uh, than the less favored ones, and the, and the offspring are going to resemble their parents. That gives you this little ratchet. And indeed, the idea that you could do that much lifting with a simple ratchet is, is a stunner. And most of the skepticism uh, has been along the lines of, well, there's just too much work to be done by such a simple process. But time and again, it's been shown, no, there's enough time. The process is more powerful than you might think. But you can understand um, why it was that uh, at the beginning, these minute ratchets, minute teeth on the ratchet, mm. would have been seen as um, implausible uh, contributions to something which was an adaptation. What I'm interested in is why do you think it was that Darwin's idea was seen as so dangerous rather than simply nonsensical? For the first 50 years, um, there wasn't enough information to make Darwin's idea anything other than um, implausible and irreverent. Why was it seen as so dangerous at that time? Well, in spite of Darwin's best efforts, the implications were there for anybody to draw, and that is, he's not just talking about birds and bees and flowers, he's talking about us. He's talking about our minds, he's talking about our conscience, our soul. Everything, if Darwin is right, is made up of little ratchets doing their little ratchety thing. And it's all just mechanical and blind and purposeless at the bottom. And this was the great inversion because until then, the idea that, that there was something like a life force, élan vital, or that there was something like a, like a soul that was completely distinguished, dis, uh, distinct from matter, and that it somehow informed and controlled and guided creative processes, thinking processes, moral reasoning, and so forth. This top-down idea about morality and self and soul was very plausible until Darwin. And after Darwin, people could see that maybe the soul could be replaced with some of those ratchets. And that's a very threatening idea. So if Darwin had not produced this dangerous idea, do you think that uh, the 
the development of infidelity, atheism, or disbelief, or however one wants to call it, would have been uh, delayed? I suppose that's a historical question that one should do very careful research on, and I haven't. But it seems very plausible to me that it was Darwin that, that, that broke the dam. Because before Darwin, <coughs> there really wasn't a good answer to the question, how did this come to be? How did this bird with this wonderful wing, how did it come into existence? If not by some divine act of creation. The, the rhetorical question, what else could it be, had no answer. That was what William Paley had said. And I think it's important to realize that Paley's argument from design is actually very, very powerful. It challenges any thinker to come up with an alternative. And Darwin called his bluff. He didn't deny the Paley argument. He said, I'm going to meet it head on. Yes, there's fantastic design in the biosphere. And I'm going to show you how you can get that design without a designer. However, e even if Darwin had succeeded in demonstrating how you can get the illusion of design without having to postulate the existence of a designer, it's still hard to resolve the problem of the relationship between minds and brains, so that philosophers, like Descartes, for example, had long ago insisted that the brain and mind were entirely separate, and even now there's a persistent belief that the mind, the soul, or whatever you want to call it, has an immaterial existence. Well, Daniel Dennett has written eloquently about the problem of consciousness, so I asked him about Darwin's attitude to this problem. Why was it that, uh, that Descartes was able to preserve the immaterial soul, and Darwin somehow felt albeit a Christian, yeah. that he did not uh, uh, feel it possible to, uh, to preserve a, a comparable sanctuary? Ah, uh, that's a good question, and especially because Wallace was able to make precisely the Cartesian move. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, said that it covered everything up to the human soul. And he drew the line there, exactly where Descartes drew the line. Wallace said, no, we have to make an exception for the human mind. And uh, Darwin famously wrote him a letter saying, I, th I think you, you, you will kill our, our child. Darwin, to Darwin, it was clear that the, that the Cartesian stop, the, the Maginot line, was, was indefensible, simply because it was clear that we're primates, we're, we're mammals. The, the continuity of nature was not going to permit one species on the planet to have miracle stuff in its brain when no other species did. I was once interviewed in Italy, and the headline of the interview the next day was, was wonderful. I saved this for my collection. It was, uh, Si, abbiamo un'anima ma è fatta di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. And I thought, exactly right. Yes, we have a soul, but it's mechanical. But it's still a soul. It still does the work that the soul was supposed to do. It is the seat of reason. It is the seat of moral responsibility. It's why we are appropriate objects of punishment when we do evil things, why we deserve the praise when we do good things. It's just not a mysterious lump of wonder stuff. Which will outlive us. Which will outlive us, yes. We, have to, we do have to give that up. And I'm sure that that's a big part of the uh, inexhaustible appeal of the idea of a soul. Uh, all you have to confront is the task of consoling a child whose parent has died. And the natural appeal of the idea of a, of a soul that goes on living is uh, it's just undeniable. It takes a strong person indeed to not to avail himself of that crutch when 
responding to a child who's just facing the the loss of a loved one. Uh, or indeed an adult facing the loss of a loved adult as well. Sure, I mean, sure. The loss of anyone. So that, sure. Um, really we're saying that the, 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 the notion of an immaterial soul, um, by definition, because it's immaterial, is that it's also uh, indestructible. I think the source of the idea of the immaterial soul that lives on after death is probably largely connected with the fact that the purpose of our, of our living souls, the purpose of our brains, is to project into the future. It's to foresee the future and to have plans and hopes about the future. And those projects and plans and anticipations make us who we are. And we share them. And so we know that the anticipated trajectories of people, and we have our own anticipations for their trajectories. We have hopes for our children and and fears for, for for our friends when they go off and do dangerous things. And it's this forward-looking, future-producing activity of the nervous system, which we can't just turn off. And when 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 somebody dies, all of those projects are suddenly put into abeyance. There's, it's hard to turn them off. And so the most natural thing in the world to go on thinking about them and thinking about, well, well if, if Sam were still here, he'd be saying this and we'd be doing this. And it's a short step from there to say, well, you know, he is still here. Well, not here, but here. But I find it very hard to see how they can actually formulate or conceive the notion of um, an immaterial continuity of an unembodied self, of how it would know that it was, in fact, the thing that had once been mm. the embodied person with a particular name, with particular projects. It always seems to me that the, the project, the notion of projects and trajectories and hopes and, and plans and so forth are all tied up with, uh, with being embodied. Oh, yes, and I think that everybody cheats when they think about this. Um, I mean, in the way that, that that scientists cheat too when they imagine uh, hard to imagine things. So people, when they imagine an immaterial soul, they don't. They imagine a, 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 a sort of ghosty, sort of uh, semi-transparent material object that that's got arms and legs and 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 a particular physical location, but just isn't you know, quite physical. Uh, it's sort of like a hologram. And uh, uh, they know that that's not, that's not right. They know that, well, uh, you know, a soul isn't really like that. And they know they can't really imagine an immaterial disembodied soul. But that's all right. You know, these things are hard to imagine. And, uh, you know, physicists can't imagine quantum mechanics, and we can't imagine an immaterial soul. But, you know, we can try, and it doesn't hurt to think about, you know, people playing harps sitting on clouds. No, I, I uh, often ask my students uh, when they were children and reading comic books or when they were watching on television, did it ever bother them that Casper the Friendly Ghost could both fly through a wall and catch a ball? I said, why doesn't the ball just <coughs> go right through his hand? And uh, almost all of them say, oh yes, they had noticed this mildly discomforting inconsistency, but everybody goes along with the gag. But everybody notices that this is not really consistent. Mm. All right then. Given the fact that both you and I subscribe to um, a radical, unreformed uh, Darwinism, how do we live with the notion of the mechanization of our own picture, the radical mechanization of our own picture. Um, what does it leave us with as persons if, in fact, we turn out to be these products of ratcheting? Well, I think it leaves us almost exactly where we've always been. We get a clearer view of the actual machinery of our of our souls if you like but what we thought our souls 
were for, what they were good for, for loving and for deciding, for just making and breaking promises for reasons good and bad. That goes on. And we're just a little bit less disillusioned, a little bit disillusioned, I should say, mm -hmm. about, about the nature of that process. But our moral quandaries are what they were before. Our moral aspirations are what they were before. Our capacity to love or to hate are intact. When I speak about Darwinism as universal acid, it passes through, it changes everything, and it leaves everything the same, too. Finally, and this issue cropped up in many of my conversations, I wanted to know how difficult Daniel found it to publicize his disbelief in modern America. But I, I started by asking him whether there had ever been a time when he himself had had religious beliefs. Now, here you are, from everything you've said and from everything you've written, I suspect that you and I would, in fact, be called by other people atheists. Was there a point at which you became one? Had you always been one? Um, or was there a, is there, in fact, a, a history of the development of disbelief on your part? I was raised in one of those bland New England suburban Protestant faiths, the congregational faith which has hardly any creed at all, but lots of good hymns and ceremonies. And I went to Sunday school and learned the books of the Bible in order, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, etc. Uh, so I got a good deal of biblical lore, uh, but not, not a stern religious upbringing by any stretch of the imagination. And I was always interested in it. Uh, Intellectually, philosophically, I was you know, a little budding philosopher. Um, I suppose that I was a teenager before I began to realize that my interest in this was, was I feel like, academic. I didn't believe it at all. And I didn't seriously think about whether I'd ever believed it uh, or whether it had been just part of a tradition that it was, yeah, you know, go along with it because it's, it's a bit offensive to, to challenge something like this. I mean, if, if, you, if you see a, 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 a terribly obese person, you don't walk up and say, my God, you're obese. Well, we don't do things like that. It's just impolite. Mm. And if people around you are being devout, it's worse than rude to challenge them. And so I don't think I ever really had I, I never had a, a conversion experience I just gradually realized that uh, I didn't believe any of this uh, I don't think I encountered many people in my youth who really believed in God I think most people who say they believe in God at, no most people in in the West who say they believe in God actually believe in belief in God. Uh, I don't even believe in belief in God. That is, they believe that belief in God is a really good thing. It is something to strive for, something to, to be maybe proud of if you succeed. Certainly you should try to believe in God, and you certainly shouldn't make it hard for others to believe in God. Um, and the behavior of somebody who believes in belief in God it's just the behavior we observe. You go to church, you sing hymns, you give money to the church, you, and so forth. If you actually believed in God, you do all sorts of lunatic things. And we don't see very many people doing those, those things. They don't, they don't put their lives on the line for God, typically. And uh, I thought it was, a, it was a little bit like belief in Santa Claus. It's something that we do. We talk about it. We sort of pretend to believe in God, and maybe the, the, the immature ones actually believe in God. And then some people grow out of it. Why is it that we have such compunctions about, um, about people's faith 
and devoutness, whereas we're perfectly willing to be uh, rude and argumentative and difficult with people's political beliefs. What is it about the belief in the sacred which is mm. sacred? I don't know, and I've been wondering that a good deal, because there are times when I think it would be much better if we were a lot franker and ruder about religious belief. If we look around the world today, I would say that by far more danger, more harm comes from religious belief on every side than help. Yes, religions at their best provide succor and meaning and comfort to people who are really hard pressed. And I think that's what we don't want to deny to the people. Yes, I mean, I don't. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm often yes. uh, rebuked mm. for being bloody rude about people's religious beliefs. I have very few compunctions about getting into arguments, mm. um, in, often in public places, about religion. And I will then go away, and my wife says, you really mustn't talk like that to things that people hold sacred. Yeah. And yet, um, she would be much less embarrassed if I was to have a stand-up row um, about, uh, about Soviet communism and about the atrocities committed by Stalin. I, myself, do not think that uh, truth is sufficient justification for saying something. And I think we all know that. We don't tell fat people they're fat. We don't tell mm. ugly people they're ugly. We don't, we don't, there's lots of things every day we can go around saying things to people's faces that would be perfectly true and we could prove them and it would just be really mischievous. It would just, there's things about me that I'm glad I don't know and I hope other people don't know. I certainly want, would want people going around spreading this around and mm. things about you. There's lots of facts that we're just as well off not knowing. That being so, any area of inquiry, especially something like philosophy, which gets so close to things that matter so much to people, I think we have to think seriously about what the, if you like, the environmental impact of putting a view out there is. It's possible that some real mischief, some real harm might come from presenting a position which is in itself perfectly true. But let's look at the boundaries of this. Mm. Um, if somebody's a member of a cult, as we say, we have no trouble being, being rude with them, with laughing at the Raelians or those, those people that got interested in the comet, uh, uh, various uh, uh, doomsday prophesiers when the prophecies don't come true. Um, uh, we laugh at those people, and the world laughs with us at them. So we have a line where we consider some religious belief to be just too kooky to take seriously. And, and we are rude with impunity but in talking because, about those. But is it because they're minority opinions? I think so. I think that's all it is. But I think this is just, I think this is just political. If, if, uh, if Christianity were uh, uh, a small sect in the world, I think it wouldn't receive the respect. But look at all the churches that the Christians have built. Look at all the great arts. Look at all the great music. Um, it's hard to be rude to a religion which has created so much great culture. I've had this friendly disagreement with Richard Dawkins over just this issue. And I say, Richard, I, of course, completely agree with you, but I don't think you want to hurt people's feelings. Why, why do you want to hurt people's, why do you want? And for a long time, I thought he didn't have a good reply to that. And more recently, I've been thinking, man, maybe I should hurt a few more people's feelings. Maybe, maybe we should turn the tide a bit on this. Maybe we well, should get out in front of this. Yeah. And, and yes, we'll take some awful lumps because we'll be the, the, the rude, evil ones. Mm. But let's, let's see if we can just move the barrier a little bit. But maybe we should, get out there with Richard and, 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 uh, and be, more, be more aggressive, just, just to open up the space behind us. 
I mean, I think this is true not just in this area. I think in religion. I think that what America really needs right now is some outspoken, bold, serious liberals. Yes, they can't be elected, but let them get out there and make a big noise so that, so that to move the center, mm. to move the effective center. And in, particularly in the United States, where, in fact, it is very closely tied up with Christian belief. Uh, certainly is. Uh, I mean, it's true that our own prime minister I, I, is a, a very pious Christian, but I don't think one can detect, as one can in Bush and one can in the in the uh, in the right wing of the Republican Party here, um, a a constitutive relationship between uh, right wing politics and uh, and born again Christianity. Oh yes, they have the strange overconfidence of the of the reli religious zealot. They're sure that the world is what their religion says it is. There's the good guys and the bad guys, and we're the good guys. And we will smite the bad guys. Now, uh, uh, granted your increasing sense of the importance of being explicit and outright and forthright yeah. about this, here you are, you've written some important influential books on various aspects of philosophy and various aspects of science in which philosophy has interests. It's hard to imagine an area in which philosophy would have more interests than religion. What would you feel about writing a book which did, in fact, smite religion with the same energy that religion itself would like to smite people like us? I'd love to write that book, uh, if I could. But, of course, what one fears is what comes afterwards. And just how much disarray, how right are the people who think that we need religion to preserve whatever veneer of civilization and good feeling we have? I think religion for many people is sort of you know moral viagra they think some people need help being moral and don't deny it to them well if that's true if religion does help people lead moral lives then one should take very seriously the proposition that we're just going to eliminate it and let the devil take the hindmost, uh, because the hindmost may be a great many people, and we may, we might, might have the chaos that these people fear. And a lot of people, many, many people, they want their life to have a meaning. And where is it going to come from? Yes, but there must be something better than religion. But I, I, I you know. yes, there, we certainly hope there is. What's it going to be? and self and soul was very plausible until Darwin. And after Darwin, people could see that maybe the soul could be replaced with some of those ratchets. And that's a very threatening idea. So if Darwin had not produced this dangerous idea, do you think that uh, the the development of infidelity, atheism, or disbelief, or however one wants to call it, would have been uh, delayed? I suppose that's a historical question that one should do very careful research on, and I haven't. But it seems very plausible to me that it was Darwin that, that, that broke the dam. Because before Darwin, <coughs> there really wasn't a good answer to the question 
how did this come to be? How did this bird with this wonderful wing, how did it come into existence? If not by some divine act of creation. The, the rhetorical question, what else could creation in the population? Some are going to be better than others. And the ones that are better than others are going to have more kids than the ones, uh, than the less favored ones. And the, and the offspring are going to resemble their parents. That gives you this little ratchet. And indeed, the idea that you could do that much lifting with a simple ratchet is, is a stunner. And most of the skepticism uh, has been along the lines of, well, there's just too much work to be done by such a simple process. But time and again, it's been shown, no, there's enough time. The process is more powerful than you might think. But you can understand um, why it was that uh, at the beginning, these minute ratchets, minute teeth on the ratchet, mm -hmm. would have been seen as um, implausible. Uh, contributions to something which was an adaptation. What I'm interested in is why do you think it was that Darwin's idea was seen as so dangerous rather than simply nonsensical? For the first 50 years, um, there wasn't enough information to make Darwin's idea. In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. I've always enjoyed my private conversations with the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, and I knew the importance he attached to Darwin's theory of evolution in the development of disbelief. So I asked him why he'd called his book Darwin's Dangerous Idea. And one of the points he made was simply that the theory of evolution was easy to understand. And that's what made it so dangerously subversive. Unlike some other great scientific advances, going back to Newton or certainly Einstein or, or best case perhaps quantum theory, unlike these bizarre revolutions, uh, I think that Darwin's theory is really quite easy to understand. It, it, you don't need any math. The basic idea is so simple that you have variation, that inevitably, if there's very Anything other than um, implausible and irreverent, why was it seen as so dangerous at that time? Well, in spite of Darwin's best efforts, the implications were there for anybody to draw, and that is he's not just talking about birds and bees and flowers. He's talking about us. He's talking about our minds. He's talking about our conscience, our soul. Everything, if Darwin is right, is made up of little ratchets doing their little ratchety thing. And it's all just mechanical and blind and purposeless at the bottom. And this was the great inversion, because until then, the idea that that there was something like a life force, élan vital, or that there was something like a, like a soul that was completely distinguished, di uh, distinct from matter, and that it somehow informed and controlled and guided creative processes, thinking processes, moral reasoning, and so forth. This top-down idea about mor 